So a new Second Amendment case is up for Supreme Court consideration. And this case shows why the Supreme Court needs to address concealed carry reciprocity and also nonviolent misdemeanor prohibitions. So let's talk about this. But real quick before we jump into this video, if you agree that the Supreme Court needs to decide more of these Second Amendment cases, go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe. So like I said in the intro, a new Second Amendment case is now up for Supreme Court consideration. The facts surrounding this case show why national concealed carry reciprocity is drastically needed right now. This case seeks review from the Supreme Court to strike down lifetime bans that prevent people with nonviolent misdemeanors from ever being able to purchase firearms. And again, this whole case arose out of a man with a concealed carry uh, license permit crossing state lines and then magically becoming a criminal because his permit was not valid in the other location. So let's talk about some of the background surrounding this case and how it's now up for Supreme Court review. Petitioner Dr. Alfred Morin is a Massachusetts resident who in October 2004 traveled to Washington, D.C. with his handgun. At the time of the incident, Dr. Morin did have a Massachusetts license to carry a firearm, a carry permit essentially, but he didn't know that D.C. and their laws prohibited him from carrying his gun in all those areas despite the fact that he had that Massachusetts license. While attending the American Museum of Modern History, uh, Dr. Morin saw that there was a sign prohibiting firearms, so he decided to approach the guard to inquire about checking his handgun that he was carrying concealed. Upon finding out that he had a concealed carry handgun, police decided to arrest Dr. Morin, charged him with carrying a pistol without a license, possession of an unregistered firearm, and unlawful possession of ammunition. On November 8, 2004, Dr. Morin pleaded guilty to attempting to carry a pistol without a license in violation of DC code. The Superior Court in DC decided to sentence Dr. Morin to 60 days imprisonment on each of those counts. However, they suspended execution of some of those counts for time served essentially, and also gave him 20 hours of community service. In February, 2008, Dr. Morin submitted an application to renew his uh, license to carry in the state of Massachusetts. After learning of his 2004 misdemeanor and those convictions in DC, the chief of police denied Dr. Morin's renewal application. In February 2015, more than 10 years after his guilty pleas, Dr. Morin decided to once again try and apply for his license to carry concealed. His application was once again denied. He then sued for a deprivation of his rights to keep and bear arms, and ultimately a district court on review found that the right to carry outside the home is different from the core right to possess a weapon inside of the home. Since it did not impact a core right, the court found that as long as the restriction served an important purpose, it was therefore valid. The district court found preventing potentially dangerous persons from carrying concealed weapons in public was an important purpose and therefore ruled against Dr. Morn. Dr. Morn then appealed that decision up to the First Circuit. The First Circuit Court of Appeal ruled that there was no constitutional deprivation because a firearms identification card in conjunction with a permit to purchase allows one to acquire a firearm and to possess it in one's home and therefore he had the ability to exercise his Second Amendment rights. Again, the court is limiting the core right to only exist within the home and saying that with the FID card and the permit to purchase, he still had the right to keep and bear arms and protect himself within the home because they said that the second amendment only applies to your protection within your home and doesn't extend to you being able to carry a firearm concealed out in public for self-defense. Well, after the First Circuit's ruling, Dr. Morin submitted an application for a firearms identification card and a permit to purchase. However, he had his permit to purchase denied by the police department because of his misdemeanors in that same incident, and they did not grant him his FID card. Dr. Morin then filed another lawsuit claiming that without his license to carry or a permit to purchase, he essentially could not exercise his right to keep and bear arms, even within his own home. The district court on review granted a motion for summary judgment in favor of the state of Massachusetts, and in doing so, they used intermediate scrutiny. The court found that individuals convicted of weapons-related offenses, punishable by a term of imprisonment, are not the type of law-abiding responsible citizens contemplated by the court in Heller. Therefore, because individuals convicted of weapons-related offenses, punishable by a term of imprisonment, are not a class of law-abiding and responsible citizens, the burden at issue did not implicate the core of the right protected by the Second Amendment, and intermediate scrutiny was appropriate. The First Circuit also stated that Dr. Morin was not outright banned from being able to obtain a handgun for self-defense, since he still could inherit one for his own protection. He could inherit one if one of his family members passed away. So that is the long and complicated mess and all the background that has now led to this case being up for Supreme Court review. The question presented in the petition is whether the state can impose a lifetime ban on purchasing handguns, but not possessing them, against anyone who has been convicted of a nonviolent misdemeanor that involved concealed carry of a firearm in another state, despite the fact that he had a concealed carry permit from his own state. 
This case shows the drastic pitfalls of concealed carry reciprocity right now. This can and does happen to a ton of people across the US who go from one state to another without understanding that their carry permit in their state may be limited to maybe only their state may not apply to the state they're traveling into. So this is one of those situations that can and does happen to a lot of people. Also, this case shows how prior to Bruin, lower courts tried to argue that the Second Amendment only applies to self-defense within the home, that it only applies to within the home. But again, that whole analysis, that whole uh, aspect of this case was struck down by the Bruin decision because the Supreme Court in Bruin said that no, the right to keep and bear arms also extends beyond the home. It extends to public carry, public protection, your right to defend yourself in public as well. It is not limited to pretty much evaporating once you walk outside of your home door. Also, the Supreme Court in Bruin rejected intermediate scrutiny, which was used by the First Circuit and the lower court in this case. So again, that drastically impacts the outcome of this case. In response to this petition, the state of Massachusetts has now filed their response and is arguing that the Supreme Court does not need to review this case. First, they argue that the petition does not present a case warranting this court's review right now. And second, that the court's decision in Bruin does not alter this case whatsoever. In the first section, the government argues that the petitioner waived their right to argue issues related to his ability to obtain firearms. They also argue that petitioner asked this court to decide whether a state can impose a lifetime ban on purchasing handguns, but not possessing them against anyone who has been convicted of a nonviolent misdemeanor that involves the possession or use of guns. The petitioner does not allege any conflict among the federal courts of appeals or between state courts of last resort over this specific question. In this section, the state of Massachusetts is hitting on the fact that the Supreme Court often takes up these types of cases and issues when there is a split among lower courts. So in this section, the government is arguing that since there is no split among the lower courts and no debate among the lower courts or the state courts, the Supreme Court does not need to review this issue. However, the Supreme Court does not just review cases when there is a circuit court split. They can also review and often do review cases when they present an important question of federal law that needs to be resolved. And that's exactly what is that issue in this case. Then the second argument the state makes is that Bruin has no impact on this case. They only dedicate about two paragraphs to this entire argument and simply they state, unlike this matter, Bruin concerns the constitutionality of a restriction on the right of law abiding responsible citizens to exercise their second amendment right to public carry. Nothing in Bruin suggests that individuals with criminal convictions can qualify as law-abiding, nor did anything in Bruin suggest that individuals like the petitioner with weapons-related criminal convictions could qualify as responsible as those terms were historically understood. Therefore, the state of Massachusetts is arguing that the court's holding in Bruin does not apply and that they should not vacate the judgment, that they should not remand the case, that they should not review this case whatsoever. They're saying that Bruin only applied to law-abiding citizens and here they're arguing Mr. Morn is not a law-abiding citizen, so Bruin does not apply whatsoever. And based on all that, they argue that the Supreme Court does not need to take up this case. Now, this case is currently set for Supreme Court conference on September 28th, so hopefully we'll know really soon what the Supreme Court decides to do with this case. If they take this case up, it will be really interesting to see maybe how they apply Bruin and ultimately maybe how Bruin will affect this case. Like I said, Bruin did impact this case because it talked about the Second Amendment right that it extended beyond the home. It did not just limit the exercise of the right to within your home. And also it rejected intermediate scrutiny. So those two things alone directly impact this case. But the state of Massachusetts is saying that Bruin has no impact whatsoever on this case and therefore the Supreme Court should not review this issue. So that's a quick rundown on a case that is currently up for Supreme Court review, a really interesting case with an interesting fact pattern. Whether or not the Supreme Court will take it up, we will have to wait and see. Uh, but right now, if I get any more information, I will let you all know. If you have any questions, go ahead and comment down below and I'll try to answer the best of my ability. Also, like this video and like support the channel, one of the best ways to do that is to like, comment, and subscribe. All those things help to fuel the algorithm or fuel algorithms with them. It adds fuel to his jet and signals to YouTube that you guys see value in these videos and in this type of two-way news. Again, I want to thank everybody who likes, comments, subscribes, who hits the notification bell, who shares these videos. You guys directly impact these videos, impact this channel, helping me to reach and educate more people than I could ever do on my own. So as always, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And never forget, this nation was built by armed scholars, and this nation will be maintained by armed scholars.